Um, hello and welcome to all in the room and to all online. Happy New Year. Thank you very much for joining us for the first event um, of the JRC this year. My name is Fabio Gigi. I'm the chair of the Japanese Research Center here at SOAS. And it is my great pleasure to welcome today's guest, uh, the writer and literary translator, Polly Barton. So I'll quickly introduce her and then we'll move to reading and conversation. And of course, the floor will be opened um, for all your questions. But before we do that, I'll change to a bit more dramatic mood setting. <laughs> Much better. Um, so Polly Barton, many of you uh, know her work. She was awarded the Fitzcarraldo Essay Prize for her essay on the Japanese language called uh, 50 Sounds in 2019. Um, she won the prize in the category non-fiction debut, um, but she also is a translator of Japanese literature and her recent translations include There's No Such Thing as an Easy Job by Kiku Kotsumura, uh, it appeared from Bloomsbury 2020, and So We Look to the Sky by Mizumi Kubo by Arcade 2021. She also won in 2021 the World Fantasy Award for Best Collection for her translation of where the Wild Ladies Are by Aoko Matsuda, which appeared with a Tilted Axis Press in 2020. So it's a great pleasure to have you here. I read this book last year during the pandemic, and it was a very interesting experience because like half of the time I thought, ah, this is exactly it. This is exactly what you experience. And uh, the other half, I think, why didn't I write something like that? Why did I write <laughs> so dreadful, dreary and dry academic <laughs> lucubrations, you know, instead of something that is much more personal, but really um, also in many ways, much more accessible. And it really is an amazing piece of work. And we are very happy to have you here. And we'll start with the reading from the beginning of the essay. Thanks very much for that introduction, Fabio. It's a joy to be here. Um, back in my alma mater, I was in SOAS myself in 2011. So yeah, it's really nice to be back. Um, I'm actually going to read, not from the essay itself, I'm, I'm going to begin by reading um, the chapter titles of, of the book, um, just to give those who haven't read it or encountered it some kind of sense of, of what it is. Um, I should, I'll just say to, to begin, um, so it's, it's called... 50 sounds um and it's it's kind of an essay in 50 essays so the book has 50 chapters um each of whose title is a subject highly subjective or wrong or very personal definition of a particular Japanese word specifically an onomatopoeic word um so I think to kind of give you a the best way of giving a bit of a flavour of of the kind of <laughs> the kind of book it is. I, I thought I'd I'd read a list of the of the titles. So fifty sounds. You know, the sound of eyes riveting deep into holes in your self belief, or vicariously visiting the nocturama, or every party where you have to introduce yourself. Giza giza. The sound of seeing what you thought was yours through the lens of an alternative system or of having your cock incomprehensibly sucked. Zara zara, the sound of the rough ground. Mushi mushi, the sound of insects being forced from your body or laughing as you vocalize an unthinkable situation or being steamed alive. Mim mim, the sound of the air screaming or being saturated in sound. Sappari, the sound of a mind unblemished by understanding. Nobi nobi, the sound of space. Moja moja, the sound of electric hair. Yochi yochi, the sound of tottering at last. Zu, the sound of always and never having been like this. 
めちゃくちゃ。The sound of a truly mixed tool bag. チラチラ。The sound of the mighty loner and the caress of 10,000 ownerless looks. ジンジン。The sound of being touched for the very first time. ポタポタ。The sound of red dripping onto asphalt. キュキキュキ。The sound of writing your obsession on a steamy tile or the miracle becoming transparent. Muka muka. The sound of nights with a dictionary and the thrill of drawing close to someone's real feelings. Hia hia. The sound of recalling your past misdemeanors. Bim bim. The sound of having lots of sex of jubitable quality. Bare bare. The sound of being so invested in something that it leaks into everything you do, or abandoning hope of appearing cool or insidious paranoia. Pick up, pick up. The, sign, the sound of my floors and your trainers and our graveyards. Jara jara. The sound of a flash of metal in the blood. Koro koro. The sound your teeny little identity makes as it goes spinning across the floor. Bishi bishi. The sound of being struck sharply and repeatedly by a stick like object or, infrequently, of branches breaking. Mote mote. The sound of being a small town movie star. Kasa kasa. The sound of the desert heat in the heart or the desert heart in the heat. Bo. The sound of a ship leaving shore. Kira kira. The sound of a hashtag magic life or embrace, embracing your shining future. Shobo shobo. The sound of persistent drizzle on a 13th century Scottish castle. Chiku chiku. The sound of kicking against the pricks or the ugliness of learning a language as a native English speaker or the manner of stabbing repeatedly with a sharp pointed instrument. Giddy giddy. The sound of just about getting by or being weighed on a moment by moment basis. Poka poka. The sound of stepping into a warm obliviousness that is probably not what a higher self would want or need. Kiri kiri. The sound of the small, sharp, dark, piercing feeling or not loving anime as much as you should. Gara gara. The rattling sound the inexplicable makes as it becomes manifest. Sikuri. The sound of fitting where you don't fit. Hisori. The sound of being a masochist or having an unrealizable dream of which you can't let go or subconsciously aspiring to a form of life governed by discipline, quietude, and an absence of sticky emotions. Peta. The sound of very sticky fingers. Pera pera. The sound of spouting forth or a bullish market. Ua! The sound of the feeling that cannot be spoken. <clears throat> Basari! The sound of never more and how it comes when you least expect it. Nudu nudu! The slippery sound of knowing the lingo. Uda uda! The sound of the wild boar. Dom! The sound of the sexy, lovely, violent hands slamming the wall. Dong. The sound of big drums, bombs, and the good bad dream. Uka uka. The sound of always being slightly wrong. Boro boro. The important sound of things falling apart. Sara sara. The sound of a very smooth fluid taking you by surprise and being the most acceptable part of you. Hot. The sound of the xenophobe returning home or being re restored to magical normality by your friends or tolerating yourself in photographs. Good tari. The sound of your words having more power than you thought or unexpectedly saying what you mean. Atsu atsu. The sound of being hot to a degree that stands just on the verge of acceptability. Uho ho. The sound of the jubilant gorilla and the foolish builder done good. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I, I think we can move, can we move up. Back? Uh, yeah, right. up. Um, 
So let's start uh, in the obvious place. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, the first question always is, you know, what inspired you uh, yeah. to write the essay? But it really, it is, it's not just an essay. It is an essay about the Japanese language. It is about Wittgenstein's philosophy of language. There's, there's wonderful riffs about different meditations, about emotionality and how it is expressed in language. But it's also kind of a Bildungsroman of you that sort of recapitulates your time in Japan. Yeah. How did it come about? Yes. Um, I So I came back from Japan about five years ago, mm -hmm. um, and it was my second stint living there. And I kind of had the sense that I was probably back for good. Mm -hmm. um, I might go back to Japan, but I was sort of done with living there, right. at least as I imagined my life. Um, and yet, and, and, and you know ostensibly I was back quote unquote home and yet I was having massive problems kind of readjusting to um life in Britain life lived in English you know I would go into shops and sort of weirdly be unable to converse in what was ostensibly my you know mother tongue um and yet you know I was also aware that I was not a perfectly fluent Japanese speaker either and I felt very much sort of suspended in this place between two languages neither of which I really felt I had mastery of um and I started kind of from that place of emotional turmoil I suppose just kind of making some notes about my time in Japan and about language um and the more that I did that the more I felt like, okay, this isn't just an emotional release. There's actually some sort of intellectual grit here. Like there's some there's something that that feels like it wants to come out. Um, and it actually around that time I read um, another translation memoir by Kate Briggs, also published by Fitzcarraldo, um, called This Little Art, where she talks about. The translation in a very in-depth way she's a, a French to English translator and she talks primarily about translating Roland Barthes um and what I think what was really revelatory to me about reading that was like she went into so much detail and yet it felt like the more she more detail she went into the more interesting it got and that kind of I think really gave me a sense of permission in a way um that that potentially I could write about this stuff that I was fascinated by and which I previously thought no one else would care about apart from you know real sort of linguistics academics mm -hmm. in a way that potentially could engage people who didn't know anything about Japan or Japanese um so that was sort of increasingly what I tried to do at that time a friend forwarded me the call out for Fitzcarraldo's essay prize um and for anyone who doesn't know that it's, it's kind of a strange essay prize it's, it's a strange title in that it's actually not given for an essay per se you apply with a proposal for a book length essay um and, and a writing sample and 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 they say sort of explicitly in in the call out that they reward ambitious writing. And it, it was in, in kind of writing that proposal that I started to formulate this idea of, you know, the, the 50 chapter structure and calling it 50 sounds and sort of this, this overarching con concept, I suppose. Right. That's, I mean, this is, it's really quite incidental, but I also read Kate Briggs actually right. the year before that. And I can, I mean, you know, you should definitely read it. It's mm -hmm. nothing to do with Japan. But it is about translation. Yeah. And for me, the most amazing scene was when she describes the, the gym that she goes to to do aerobics. It has nothing to do with translation, but yeah. there's something about the attention to detail, the attention to the small worlds that are somehow slightly different mm -hmm. depending on what language you look at them uh, in. And that, I thought that was really, and this is really what, what you capture so well um, in the book as well. And what, what was it that attracted you to Japan in the first place that's always a difficult question right but well, it, everybody in the room I think uh knows that question sure I mean it is a really difficult question and, and in some sense I feel like you could define this book 
as like my attempt to kind of answer that because I feel that there was there were so many different things that drew me to Japan um but none of them felt like the main thing and actually what led me to go there in the first place I think was really um sort of seeing my my boyfriend at the time um showed me a advert for the the jet program and we decided to apply to that together um but really I wanted to go to Italy um (laughs) that was I I had my sights set on going to Bologna um and he was like come on let's just apply to this um and I was reading a lot of Japanese literature at the time but it, it you know I'm definitely not I think there are some people who sort of know from the age of people not living in Japan who know from the age of seven, eight, nine, ten, that, you know, all they want to do is to go to Japan. And I'm definitely not one of those people. And I think that's, you know, in a, in a way that really is a big part of the impetus for this book, because I, I get to this point now and, you know, I'm in my late thirties and my life really is Japan. You know, I, I spend all of my time reading Japanese books, mm-hmm. but I, even speaking to people like, far as you know, in my who I was on an on undergrad with like back then I I read a lot of Japanese books but I didn't you know that that direction that I've taken is totally difficult for them to understand and it's sometimes quite difficult for me to understand and yet it also feels a part of me so I a a very important part of me so I suppose that yeah the the 50 sounds is kind of an attempt to wrestle with that in some in some way well, the mind boggles to imagine what it would have been if it had been about Italian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it wouldn't have been at all, I think. <laughs> um, so um, maybe for the p- people who are not familiar with uh, the linguistics of Japanese, uh, we could say uh, something about the om- onomatopoeia and uh, what what sort of, you know, how, because it's structured around them. And I thought that was, it's such a brilliant idea and they're all rendered as we've heard in very creative ways that really make you think about the relationship between a sound and and also the fact that you can recognize sometimes what it is even if you don't know what what the word means right that I, I exactly that you, sometimes you can recognize them and sometimes you can't recognize them but nonetheless they're so sort of evocative mm-hmm. sounding that they really like stick into you and i think um when i started these sort of random writings about Japanese that I was doing after I came back to Bristol. Um, I, I found that increasingly these uh, onomatopoeia kept popping up again and again. And I, it, it wasn't at first, it wasn't at all a conscious choice. It was just a kind of reflection of the fact that those were some of my earliest memories. And, you know, and I should say that, that part of this and part of, I, think this whole book where this whole book comes from is that when I so I was first placed on Sado Sado Island Sado Gashima um which is a, a very rural remote island with quite a small population um people don't speak a huge amount of English there I spoke no Japanese at all really I could say hajimemashite and that was it um and so it I, it was like really very much kind of learning from the ground up and, and picking up things, you know, and just sort of, and, and and I think in that state, your ears are really tuned and, 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 you know, you sort of, rather than thinking with your brain, you're, you're, it's much more a kind of, I don't know, you're thinking with your body, you're thinking with your ears. And it, it often was the onomatopoeia words that would really stick with me. And I'd be like, what? Why did they say that? What What was that? You know, and a very kind of distinctive structure. Um, okay, for, for people who aren't familiar with Japanese onomatopoeia, so it, it's still a little bit of a rough science because how onomatopoeia is defined linguistically varies from um language to language and so you know in in English there's a lot of debate about whether certain words are onomatopoeic or not but it's commonly thought that Japanese has the second largest body of onomatopoeic language of any language other than Korean so Korean has the most and Japanese is second to that um and unlike 
English, where the, the, the boundary between onomatopoeia and non-onomatopoeia is quite blurry and sometimes not at all clear to even native speakers of English. In Japanese, it's much, much more clear cut. Um, and some linguists classify onomatopoeic language as one of the four kind of specific types of words that make up the entirety of the language. Um, and so one very common kind of um, form that onomatopoeia in Japanese takes is words like giza giza, which is like a reduplicating thing. So it's the same two syllable word repeated, um, but that's not the only kind. Um, yeah, it's, it's a it's a variety, but but they do they do sort of follow quite set templates. Right. I thought actually one one that that when when I started reading, I thought oh there must be a chapter on Shin, the sound of silence. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> <It's> too obvious. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the I think I did toy toy with the idea of doing one on Shin, but that's the one you know in sort of Guardian articles that reference <laughs> onomatopoeia. That's the one they always bring up, right? Japanese even has a word for silence. <laughs> um. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, I think we're all familiar with that, that kind of, yes, Guardian, BBC occasionally also dabbles yes, in, yes. oh, how, isn't this uh, funny or strange or interesting? Um, untranslatable words. Untranslatable, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Which, 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 of course, I mean, yes, that's that that whole that's other it, yes. uh, barrel um, of questions there. But actually, yes, maybe we should uh, transition Great. Um, to the second reading. Second reading, yes. Um, and then we'll uh, talk a little bit about translation. Sure. Um, and yes, and I'll transition myself to the <laughs> lecture. Um, Let me just have a quick look. There's some, I always panic when there's a, a question at this oh. stage. May, sometimes means there is no, oh, hello, good evening to New York too. So I thought okay. maybe somebody said that this, the voice, uh, the sound wasn't working. <laughs> Great. Okay, so... Um, I'm going to read from the chapter Koro Koro, which is arguably the chapter that's kind of most squarely about translation, or at least one of them. Um, it's it's one of the longer chapters, so I'm not going to read the whole thing. Um, I'll just read the the first bit. Koro Koro, the sound your teeny little identity makes as it goes spinning across the floor. Sometimes, when I'm talking about what I do for a living with non-translator friends or acquaintances, typically those who speak only one language, I start to build up a picture of the practice of translation as they conceptualize it. Its pale contours coalesce gradually, like a Polaroid forming. In this representation of it, translation is akin to an elaborate autocorrect function, and it works like this. I am a good Japanese speaker. This must be true, as I am a translator. And therefore, my brain houses the correct English translation for each Japanese word. To move a text between two languages, all I have to do is switch the Japanese words over to their relevant English correlates, and then maybe fiddle about with the order a little in order to yield the correct translation at the sentence level. Excuse me. Often, in these kinds of conversations, this exact phrase, the correct translation, will be used multiple times. And each time, I will feel a sort of pang, which I don't quite know how to interpret. At times, I wonder if it is a yearning for the days when I could still place trust in the meaning of those words and use them with no critical awareness, no sense of suspicion towards the assumptions on which they rest. Or maybe it's closer to an imagined nostalgia for the world, if it really were, as my interlocutor believed, if there really were a singular, correct translation for each word, and translation operated on the word level, and the task of the translator were to reproduce the exact number of words that appeared in the original, and so on. I wouldn't want a world like that, but it would make things a lot more straightforward. 
In any case, even when people tell me that the profession I've chosen is mechanical or more a science than an art, I don't resent them. It makes me wonder what preconceptions I'm carrying about, carrying about jobs I know nothing about. What I find less easy to laugh off is other polyglots, even other Japanese translators, who still have a very firm idea of what the correct translation is, who go around liberally sewing definite articles as they speak of their craft. These people are not thick on the ground, but they do exist, and I end up praying for them that this is either just an entrenched speech pattern or else a rhetorical front, an act of bravado to perfect to protect their egos. In other words, I pray that this is not what they really think. Surely, I reason, they must have had the experience of looking down at two alternative translations of roughly equal merit, which respectively draw out different aspects of the source text that seem important, but cannot be incorporated at the same time. What happens to singular correctness in that moment? And what about the tension that exists between the requirements of a sentence in the source language and that in the target one? Surely they must have taken on board that the definition of what constitutes translational perfection is always going to vary depending on whom you ask. So that to declare a translation not just good, but uniquely correct, seems tantamount to legitimizing the demands of one culture over another. What I find the most extraordinary, though, is reflecting that, as translators, and therefore, to some extent, surely also speakers, these people have most likely had to express themselves in multiple languages, which raises a point that feels even more fundamental. Have they not wrestled with the brain warping activity of having to translate themselves across different languages? Have these people not, as I have, watched their identity contort into rainbow fractals, vanish entirely, and then return as a pink-spotted dragon? I know that it's unreasonable to expect everyone to have gone through existential crises over this, although part of me does really think that if they were sufficiently invested and sufficiently sensitive, then they would have experienced at least minor ones. But surely at some point down the line, they must have stared into the face of this difficulty and watched the possibility of a definite article fizzle up and vanish. And if they have, then what prevents them from connecting this experience with what they do from a profession? <laughs> I'm aware that this picture of adversity in self-translation does not conform with the received picture of multilingualism. The conventional monoglot sense of what it means to be bilingual, trilingual and beyond does not permit of difficulties in self-rendering, let alone existential crises or identity trauma. We we prefer to believe unthinkingly that what it means to be yourself across different cultural linguistic contexts is clear cut. You say the same things translated across your various languages. That the reality is often hugely different is something to which the majority of those who speak another language with some fluency will testify. A survey of over a thousand bilinguals found that two thirds attested to feeling like a different person when speaking different languages. To imagine a language means to imagine a life form. To assume that you would be the same person in different languages, when not only the norms and rules, but most likely also your social status and domains of experience and proficiencies within those languages are likely to be at least slightly, if not fundamentally different, seems, when examined, plainly bizarre. I should confess that growing up monolingual, this flawed picture was mine for a long time. I never waded deep enough into the French and German I studied at school to disabuse myself of the notion that translation was switching one utterance for a roughly parallel one. Speaking a language was knowing what I wanted to say in English and saying, or trying to say, something that, to my mind, meant that in French. Despite the desires for rebirth that propelled me to Japan, it didn't occur to me that acquiring the language spoken in a culture very different from mine would mean developing a new persona, and the revelation, draw the revelation dawned only very gradually. I suppose that part of the reason that this revelation takes so long to hit is that for a long time, speaking a foreign language feels just that, foreign. 
which is to say new and transitory and very hard to link up with thoughts about our identity. Another, I believe, is because when learning a language in another country, the developments we make are so heavily socially rewarded, meaning we process our transformation as sheer success, or at least I did. I'm finally communicating. I'm doing this. I'm being approved. Following the crowd felt like something to be celebrated rather than ashamed of, and I kept it up until one day I was confronted by the sudden, yet now blindingly obvious awareness that this was conformity, pure and simple. For the moment, I was saved from total assimilation by the inaccuracy of my mirroring, which was why I was still able to feel more or less myself. But if I continued to get better, I reasoned, there might come a time where there was no longer room for the me I recognized to exist alongside this increasingly expert mimic. In other words, the extent of my skill in pretending to be like other people was exactly the extent to which I ceased to be myself. Was it really that simple? The whole thing resembled a brain teaser, and it made me think back to studying identity as an undergraduate. For a while then, it had been fun to muse on the various ways that philosophers had sought to address this issue over time, until it had promptly become te tedious. Either way, though, it had been an intellectual exercise that had little point of contact with my real life. Ultimately, it didn't really matter how you conceptualised it, because in the real world, everyone just got on with it and was fine. Now, I felt differently. The conundrums still had that tricksy, puzzle-like quality to them, but now the concern I felt was real. I wanted a branch, either emotional or cerebral, onto which I could grip as I, cro as I crossed this swamp of doubt, but I could see none. I had already set down the path of imitation and society rewarded my progress thereon. So I kept on tramping. And at some point I found myself in the swell of a further wave of identity doubt, where a symmetrical suspicion drifted in about my original self. Maybe this original me, which figured in my thinking was more nebulous, more tied to English than I realised. Wasn't a large part of being me simply the fact of having been very ordinarily talented at mim mimicking the people around who'd, whom I'd grown up? Was it fair or valid to attach any kind of primacy to that form of mimicry just because I'd practised it for so long it had become a thoroughly unconscious competence? And the more I thought about it, the more it did seem to me that there was nothing desperately inner or innate about this self, that the relationship I had with it was constructed from the outside and structured by language. Even just thinking these thoughts felt intolerably teenage angsty to me, and I wanted it over with. Perhaps the important thing was just to plough on through. Perhaps eventually I would get to the point where I shifted between different selves amongst which there was no hierarchy of primacy and barely paid their difference any mind. And yet I couldn't stifle the doubts that I was doing this all wrong, missing a trick in some way, that I should be finding it easier, managing the transition better. This perception was reinforced by the comments people directed my way. I didn't know if this was par for the course or not, but each time it happened, it felt like a stab in the back. Your voice is so much higher when you speak Japanese. You know you're really different in the two languages. How do you feel about that? You're much softer and cuter in Japanese. You're serious and scary when you speak English. These are all things that have been said to me by different people, and each time the presentation was that of simply stating a fact as if to disown any idea that the statement could be taken the wrong way. As I felt a twinge of dread in my chest, see, I am a spineless person after all. I would wonder to myself why it was exactly that I found it so hurtful. Did I actually believe that it was bad to change? Or did I just know that belying the apparent innocence with which these comments were voiced, changeability carried a negative social value? Thanks. Thank you. That's a, a perfect a moment to turn our attention um, towards translation, towards uh, translation as a practice, not just as an intellectual exercise, but really 
as uh, as a profession. Mm. And I wanted to ask you whether you could tell us something about what what, did, what it's like being a freelance translator. How do you choose the things you translate? Um, is there sort of, you have lots of things in the pipeline or is lots of it serendipitous? The thing that I say about being a freelance Japanese translator, and I am really aware as I say this, that this is the case for me and and the case I think for Japanese but very much not for European languages but every product every pro product every project that I've <laughs> that I've worked on so far has been really different in t in 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 all ways in terms of how it's come to me in terms of kind of the editing process um you know, when you're starting out as a translator and have hopes of being a literary translator, everyone, at least in my case, would tell me that, you know, the way that it works is that with the quote unquote minority languages, mm. you find a book that you want to translate, you check the rights, you do a sample, you do a synopsis, and then you pitch this cold to people that you've never met. And then they will give you, if you if you get lucky, um, they will give you a translation contract. In the real world, um, that is an extremely rare occurrence, um, but it has actually happened once to me. Right. Um, so that's that's one end of the spectrum but at the other end often people that are editors that I know will come to me and they will already have a project in mind sometimes they will have already bought the rights to a particular book and just be looking for a translator and um, sometimes you get asked to do what's called a beauty contest where you produce a sample um in the knowledge or or not in the knowledge but that other translators are are also producing samples and then whosoever style they like best they choose to go with um and sometimes i, I would say the, the middle the middle case is something um like a bit like what happened with where the world ladies are actually um so when alco and i were both over in the uk from japan um on a residency together we met with deborah smith who was at the time head of tilted axis press and she said to alco and i over dinner like I really like your stuff, but, you know, and we would like, we're interested in publishing you, but we'd like to sort of hear a bit more. And so I then worked together with Alco and we produced samples and synopses for a number of her books and discussed it with Deborah. And then they decided to go with where the world ladies are because um, they felt like that had the most appeal. Um so yeah, there's, there's, it's 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 really a very kind of every case is is different type thing. Right. I would say um, <laughs> these days, I, I suppose now because I've added writing to my bow, and I'm also currently translator in residence at Queen's College Oxford for the year. Um, I'm finding that I just don't have the time to do <laughs> lots and lots of kind of scouting work which I, I ideally I would really like to do but it you know it's so time consuming and I think also it's especially hard when you don't have access to Japanese bookshops you know I haven't been back right. in three years and it's it's so much quicker for me at least just to go around sort of physically and and sort of think oh that looks that looks tempting um so yeah I've, I've been reduced to using Amazon and right. so on and so forth um, <laughs> Yeah. So I would say that's interesting. I mean, Queen's College trans translator in residence. What yes. does that entail? So yeah, <laughs> um, I'm actually not in residence. Oh. Um, but I'm I'm going there several times a term, kind of putting on various translation related events okay. for various demographics. So kind of in schools, right. um, public facing events and also for students but the 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 remit is um the visible translator so it's it's about kind of presenting a version of translation to people that is something broader than what most of us 
conceive of it as you know kind of right. turning something French into something English right. um so so translation as a kind of clue that really can connect so many different disciplines right. um it's been it's been really great so far that's, that's, that sounds very interesting. Mm. <clears throat> more practical questions, because we are now all always, you know, impelled by our superiors to to ask, well, what can you do with that? You know, what can you do with an MA in yeah. translation studies? I, I was uh, the, maybe a slightly cheeky question. Mm. Can one live of it? Can one live of literary translation? Literary translation. <laughs> So there was a really interesting panel discussion put on recently by the National Centre for Writing oh. about this called Warts and All. Um, and I think it might be still available online. And they invited three literary translators to speak exactly on exactly this question. And I think up until that point, I, I knew that this was slightly the case, but until seeing this, I hadn't really realized to what extent that question is language specific mm. so they had an arabic translator a german translator and a oh my god who was the third person um someone else whose whose language will come back to me in a second um and the german translator wasn't always doing full-on literature literature she does non-fiction but essentially she lives off right her translation it's solely literary translation right. and and that is possible it's not it's still you know it's it's still only a few lucky people who get to do that but it, within the infrastructure it is possible the third one was a korean translator oh. and um and the korean person said I am managing it but I am one of only four people and there's only demand for those right. four the Arabic translator said no way no way is it possible right. um given the kind of the yeah the infrastructure that's that's there um so I feel like it's really important to to, to kind of stress that because I otherwise I think it can end up being you know a stick that people used to beat themselves with like I haven't managed to make it as a literary translator it really I mean it's really hard to begin with and it really depends on what funding essentially is available government sponsored usually but but you know all commercial funding is available the thing that I would say in response to this I mean this is always the question right can you make a living solely off literary translation is that potentially that's slightly the wrong question or or rather you know these days I'm, I'm doing writing and 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 I'm doing this translator in residence which has kind of slightly muddied the water but until three years ago I spent half of my time doing literary translation and the other half doing um well, mostly translating um, art catalogues, essays oh, okay. for art catalogues. Right. So, you know, quote unquote, commercial translation, but kind of aligned with my interests, much more lucrative than literary translation, really enjoyable. And actually, like, for me, kind of being able to switch between the two kind of when I would return to my literary translation, I'd feel really invigorated by it, but it would also be really nice to have days not doing that. And 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 so I guess what I'm trying to say is I think it is possible for a certain number of people to make a living exclusively from literary translation, but it's also a wonderful, you know, it's it's ideally suited to combining with other things that are aligned with your interests, whether they be teaching, whether they be different mm. types of translation, whether they be, you know, website building, um, what whatever it is. Um, and and actually a lot of the most eminent literary translators working today do do combine it with other right. things, I guess. I mean that's that's really interesting. It also reflects a kind of hierarchy of legibility, like is you have certain uh, maybe yeah minority languages uh, you mentioned at the beginning, but but of course then there's the big bestsellers like Murakami sure. and how are these there there's already established people usually that, that 
Yeah. Like some kind of literary mafia, one imagines. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Murakami <laughs> has had the same three translators who see, seem to kind of be on rotation for quite a while. I think that's quite an impenetrable Close. fortress. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but then, you know, I, I feel like there is a new... <laughs> What I always say to people when we're talking about translation is before convenience store women, every editor that I pitched a translation to, well, not everyone, but I would often be asked the question, but is it is it the next Murakami? Right. <laughs> and what's been really interesting is post convenience store women I mean for the for the first three years after that the question shifted to is it the next convenience store right. woman right. and now I don't we've got, now we've got such you know with um Miyako Kawakami and and her success and uh, you know this, this kind of constant stream it feels like of literature predominantly by contemporary Japanese women writers I'm I'm not even getting asked the convenience store woman question anymore. Right. It just seems like there is a market right. for it and people right. trust that. And we don't need a kind of, you know, deity-like figure who sort of stands at the, the head of the market. It's just sort of, it's much more, I don't know, diverse, I suppose, and right. democratic or something. But clearly also driven by the fact that there are really high quality translations available. So so you you... That's what, yeah. you know, what what people used to say in the 19th century. It is it is the readership that creates sure. the author, and the author creates the readership. It's not just a market. And once you have that interest, you sort of go and see what, whatever else. Yeah. There. And I think yeah. that that's an interesting dynamic. Um, but also, I wanted to ask you about the really sort of day to day process mm. as well, because as you as we've just seen in 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 the last um, excerpt, often translation really, I mean. It involves the whole self. It is almost it becomes a question of life and and, and mm. death. It sometimes feels. How do you how do you deal with that in your everyday <laughs> life? <laughs> um, it's a really good question. Yeah, I, I think that's that's also something that I wanted to really highlight in Fifty Sounds because I think you know there's a a way of thinking about translation that it is sort of slightly mechanical mm. and you know the 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 kind of stereotypical figure of the author is someone who's you know pouring out their blood and guts and sweat and tears and into writing these things and the translator is much more um professional let's say or you know and sort of signs off <laughs> for the day um and not only is it not like that? But, you know, with, with my experience of writing my own stuff, at least you can kind of have that. No, sod it. It doesn't matter. Right. Kind of feeling, you know, when it, when it gets all too much. Whereas with translation, you've got the added responsibility of it being someone else's work mm. that you're presenting you know so th there <laughs> you kind of can't say if you say sod it I can't I can't do any I can't do any better than this this will have to do you're not only doing that for yourself but you're doing it on behalf of someone else which I think is is quite weighty um that said of course you are not you know you're not it is a different process to writing. You're not coming up with the story. And, you know, I would be lying if I said that my relationship to translation is totally diva. Like, you know, I, I, I have a certain number of words that I can, I know I can get through in a week and I do that. And I, you know, unless something goes really wrong, I usually can predict relatively accurately right. how, how that's going to go. There are things that I tussle with um but I think yeah I think after a time you just sort of learn to I don't know 
put it put put the put the life and death to one side and think about it tomorrow right. um I think also what what's really helped me is you know when I first started translating I can remember you know when I was back at SOAS working on my my dissertation and I was doing an annotated translation for that and I was so so invested in it mm. you know and and it took me a while to realize that actually that as, as terrible as it sounds to say you know that that investment does not a good translation make ultimately you know and I would often see other people who would be so invested and that's if anything that investment is is you know you often you need a bit of perspective right and you need a bit of I think a really key um part of being a good translator is Learn and, and and possibly a good writer mm. learning to see what you've done through someone else's eyes or at least a, you know a, a more objective perspective and there's various ways of doing that and a, you know a really important one is putting it away and not right. looking at it for a few days and then returning it to it with fresh eyes um I suppose all I'm trying to say is I think passion is obviously really important. Mm. But in order to kind of maintain a career, not and not just a career professionally speaking, but in order to have it as like a sustainable part of your existence. So you're not tearing yourself to pieces. You also need to kind of learn, learn some kind of detachment or to put some kind of distance between right. yourself and it as well. Uh, I think, yes, I can I can very much imagine how that becomes life life saving essentially and so um as we're drawing to a close i wanted to finish off with um essentially with how the essay starts because you write a, a, there's a brief introduction where the uh, duolingo is mentioned many of you may be familiar it's, it's this app that you can download to learn languages and i find i found it very interesting recently um, a friend, a friends of mine went to Japan with their 12 year old son, and they were quite worried in the lead up. They didn't speak Japanese, um, but the 12 year old son had some kind of translation software that you could even point. You could take a picture of something of a kanji and then it would give you the translation immediately. And I, I heard that and I thought, oh, that's, you know, I felt slightly conflicted about it for obvious reasons. <laughs> And also, I, I went to Japan when I was 16 for the first time. I lived with the host family, and I'm still in contact with them. And all my host brothers, they now have children. And I noticed that their children uh, speak exactly the same degree of English than their parents, which is almost uh, nothing. But they always say, oh, it's no problem, because now we have all these technological devices that will do the work for us. Uh, so how do you see the future of translation in the face of this whole AI juggernaut that we are facing? It's such a it's such a thorny question, <laughs> isn't it? I recently saw this meme, um, which is a picture of like a, a, a translator costume, you know, the kind of that you buy in. I don't know, costume shops, and it contained a dictionary and, I don't know, a roll neck and a, a bald spot. And then it said, does not contain the patience to explain for the thousandth time why they're not worried about AI <laughs> taking away their job. And and I think that, you know, that is the standard translation, literary translation line, right? This is... we writers authors don't get asked that question and um composers don't get asked that question and artists don't get asked that question or, or at least not to the same degree so why why should translators be asked that question and i i really understand that line of thinking you know i mean i at the same time i think we also are coming to a point and you know seeing all this kind of AI generated artwork, we are coming to a point where um, I think kind of general understanding is dawning that AI really is going to change our world drastically in, in, in kind of unthinkable ways. I suppose 
my take on that is is just that literary translation will be affected by that, but potentially not incomprehensibly more than other right. artistic disciplines. Um, I, from what I understand, you know, translation software, deep L and, and that kind of stuff really is making strides. And I think there is already cause for, you know, people who translate contracts and things which operate really using kind of set patterns you know that's already sort of changing things radically where I am I'm not seeing that mm. so far um but I, yeah I, I it's it, it's a really thorny thing and I you know hearing that about the, the kids and sort of thinking of learning a language mm. simply as work that you would rather have replaced by a robot seems right. to me to kind of overlook so much of like the joy that can be found in learning languages and translating and you know and and I think again one of the things that I wanted to sort of really make clear in 50 Sands or which kept kind of hitting me again and again as I was writing it is how that how the difficulty and the joy are inseparable really right. they are the same you know different sides of the same coin I guess um so yeah uh, yeah I, I mean the, the hearing that it does make me kind of curious to use these apps and see or, or to see someone using them and see what's what's that's actually going on um yeah well I, th I think yes uh, there, there's a terrible sense of impoverishment if you think about the the, the, the aspect of learning yeah um, but if you think about you know like if, if the AI which has no kind of language intelligence at all which is just a, a big language model that sort of has access to 120 years of literary translation and can immediately sort of list okay yeah. uh, these people translate this exactly. similar passage like this um Yes, it would sort of it, it would change the dynamics sure. a little bit. You would be ending up sort of more editing and curating mm. what, what is already there, mm. um, which I think is precisely it's very joyless if you think about. It. Yeah, um, yeah, it is, and it's interesting you say that because you know when I'm translating um, work by or, an author who's already been translated into English by someone else. Uh -huh. I deliberately don't look at right. those translations until after I'm done. Right. And I know that that's an approach that other people think is, you know, scandalous. And why, <laughs> well, firstly, scandalous and secondly, stupid. Like, why wouldn't you look? And and also, you know, it's your duty to kind of educate yourself on this before you do it. But I think for me... Hmm it really impedes that process of, of finding of the voice, you know, which is 70% of, right. of what translation is for me, I suppose. Um, I think I'm, I'm already really bad with kind of internalizing and mimicking styles without even realizing it. And so I think if I was, if I were to read the work of someone else, regardless of whether I liked it, I would end up sort of, mimicking it and right. that, and I think that yeah that I mean that necessarily prevents the genesis of something new right whether or not that you know I think new can be good or bad and you know the cult of originality is not always to be trusted but but nonetheless yeah yeah and I, I suppose the more we rely on AI technology in translation the less chance there is for opening up those totally new ways of right. doing things or you know finding totally new voices and, right. and so on. um yeah that said i don't want to come across as a technophobe um <laughs> but because i think you know i know from experience from talking to lots of translators that there are you know there's there's huge benefits to be gained from machine translation right. um and realistically if people are going to japan and they can't speak they haven't learned to speak Japanese then being able to have a conversation even if it's mediated by a phone is better than not right. being able to have a conversation right. at all I thought that's a very good yeah that's a very good point 
Right, uh, let's open to the floor. I'll, I'll switch on the lights so we can see you. And also let's open to the people online. So please put your questions into the... Oh, let's see. Ah. Oh. Hello. Any questions from the floor? Yes, please. Hi. Um, Hi. Thanks, Wally. That was, that was fantastic. Um, I was really interested in what you said about how uh, language acquisition, uh, con consciously or not, can be a chance to kind of create a new identity. Um, and it struck me that also writing might have something of that to it, creative writing, uh, especially given your essays and personal um, inspiration. So I wanted to ask if you felt that if, what kind of book would it have been if you'd written it in Japanese? Mm. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> a terrible one. <laughs> would you be interested in, in translating yourself into Japanese? It's a really, that's a really great question. Thank you. Um, I don't, it, this is something that I've spoken to my publisher about, actually, because um, they had a, a little bit of interest in it being translated into Japanese. Um, and I essentially said that I didn't want it to be. Um, because I feel like it needs it needs to be in dialogue with it with Japanese it's not that I don't want it to be translated but I sort of feel that there needs to be a language other than Japanese through which that experience of learning Japanese is going to be mediated or you know because otherwise <laughs> there's no kind of triangulation point, there's no distance <laughs> from it. And maybe that is really um, short-sighted and maybe actually a brilliant Japanese translator could do a great job. Um, it, but so Shibata Motoyuki-sensei translated a little bit um, for a blog article that he did. And, you know, obviously he's, arguably the most translate most talented translator working from English and to Japanese and he did a wonderful job and yet I I still had this feeling like this, this isn't quite yeah just as I'm not sure that I would want to read a book about a Japanese someone Japanese or someone French learning English in English, you know, I'm not sure how much it could give. Yeah, it, yeah, it is interesting. And just speaking it through makes me think that maybe I should say to my publisher, actually, if, if someone wants to give it a try, then they can go for it. <laughs> um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. There's a, a, a question um, here from James Garza. We have uh, 36 participants online, more than in the room, I think, for the uh, first time. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, shall I, I'll read it out. Yeah. Uh, your readings are marvelous. Thank you. This is totally a translation nerd question, but your Koro Koro chapter reminded me. Even in places where bilingualism is actively promoted as a social and intellectual good, there's often the sense that the two languages should nevertheless remain apart, uncontaminated by each other. Do you ever get the sense that translation reinforces this kind of distance between different language worlds? Is this necessary to promote respect for the distinctiveness of cultures, or does it reinforce a kind of cultural essentialism? I ask with no firm answers myself. <laughs> <laughs> Thank I know, James. Hi, James. Thank you for your incredibly difficult question. Um, <laughs> do you ever get the sense that the translation... Re yeah. I think... So just to repeat that part, do you ever get the sense that translation re reinforces this kind of distance between different language worlds? Yes, I definitely have had that sense before. 
Um, and I think that what I'm not clear about is whether that's translation per se, translation as an act, praxis, discipline, or whether that's translation as it is presented in our culture. I say our culture in, in, in most cultures that I am aware of, and you know, particularly in academia. Um, something that has been interesting about doing this Oxford residency is, is trying to present translation in a way that is accessible for people who don't, who are monolingual, who only have English as a language or, 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 or going into a space and not really knowing who is going to be there. Um, and, and something that I've been working with is, is both kind of intersemiotic translation. So looking at the translation of, um, you know, one, one form into one form into another. So be that a film into a, play or a book into a play or, or or whatever um and then also intralinguistic translation so working translating a certain kind of english into another kind of english or or simply you know one modern english into another version of the same modern english um which is obviously that something that japanese also does in a in a very interesting way, like with the with the modern translations of a Tale of Genji and so on and so forth. Um, and the reason that I'm talking about this is because I feel like within that context, and particularly when you are working within the context where where everyone is kind of translating together, I start to get a sense of translation that is not divisive in 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 that way you know that that if we can kind of expand our definition our working definition of what translation can be then that then forms a good basis to kind of reapply it to translation when we're talking about interlinguistic translation between two languages and and sort of approach it with with respect but without the kind of essentialism um <coughs> but i don't really know how that can be transmitted in a kind of broader more more society wide sense i guess um yeah, and no apologies for the question. That was it was great. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, in in the, I think that in, in a sense that the, the translation as translation only really emerges when you when when you know you know you read the translation and it allows you access to this work, but you're not aware of the translation because the tr translation is the medium through which you access yes. the work. But if you know the original text and you then read the translation, then you suddenly realize the craft of translation. Right. And that's a, it's a quite a different kind of reading. You yeah. Think, oh, oh, okay. Oh. Yeah. You know, so it, yeah. it changes again the way you see the text. Yeah, and and yeah, the sort of visibilizing it. And, mm. and, and it's this strange thing that we've done for so long in, I think, certainly English speaking, countries of, of yeah kind of presenting translation as a sort of magic trick and not wanting to state it or state the name of the right. translator and right. you know all kind of hush hush but actually yes like you say and you know one of my favorite things is is parallel right. texts which I think a lot of translators find really intimidating as a prospect because it you know it immediately feels like people are going to be kind of picking holes but I think increasingly that's the direction that we need to move towards and and not not seeing them as you know the same thing or precise equivalents but but different mm. versions right 
Oh, that's a, I think yes, that's I, that's a really interesting. I, I used, as a child, I used to love the. I grew up in Switzerland, and so we always had French, German, uh, or English French or English German uh, bilingual texts, and it was always the most amazing. And they had many many footnotes, so you could sort of check what mm. the expressions actually meant. Do any more questions from the floor? I think there's loads on there there's okay potentially I, I saw a big eight thing but then that might be oh no that's comments oh oh gosh yeah um, no no, no. it's is there any... <laughs> <laughs> anyone from the room I give you yes go on Kirsten. hi um, a bit more of a personal question i guess but in terms of um you're talking about identity and coming back to the uk then it's really just kind of almost that possible between who you are in Japan and who you are here in the UK. How do you feel that being back in the UK as a British person has shaped your translation in any way? That's a really great question. Thank you. Um, I think talking to people in a sort of daily way um while being here does help it, it, you know it's 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 still wavering but it has helped to give me a firmer sense of kind of the average per what the average person knows about japanese culture um in, t in terms of sort of both like terminology and more kind of conceptually speaking I suppose um and then the question is how far to kind of ignore that when when you're translating um I, there's a there's a an article um written by the Korean translator Anton Her, um, who was one of the three in the Warts and All um, conference, about um, it's called the mythical English reader, um, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. But it, you know, sort of like it's talking about this this kind of uniform this this trope of the the english reader who is the the particularly editors at publishers will invoke as this kind of specter to to as a reason why you can't kind of foreignize your translations or sort of include things that you know include too many words that are from the japanese language um and and his take and my take as well is that you know readers do often like to be challenged or are, are up for a challenge are up for learning things and actually when we read books by native english writers there are generally many words that we don't know and people you know constantly have their phones by them and they can google things at any point anyway so what difference does it make and i do kind of subscribe to that um sorry i feel like i've gone off on a tangent <laughs> i have gone off on a tangent um to come back to your question I'm not sure if it changes my translation in any other way than that, at least that I'm conscious of. But it's something that I'd like to think about. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So there's two more questions, three more questions in the chat. Uh, Jason Danley uh, asks, Thank you. I loved 50 Sounds and hope to see you when you're in Oxford next. My question, you vividly describe what it's like for a language to get under the skin. Would you say that a translator must not only speak, write, speak slash write Japanese, but feel in Japanese? Is there such a thing as Japanese feelings, at least as much as there is a Japanese language? I would not 
Thank you for the question. Um, I would not like to make prescriptions about what a translator needs to do. Um, and I... Nor would I like to say whether or not there are Japanese feelings. I, I mean, I, one of my great fascinations is how different experiences, but particularly kind of bodily and emotive states are classified in different, across different languages, right? And, and the sort of overlapping, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of picturing it like this huge chaos that we feel and, 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 and trying to kind of put that into, to, to, to different, you know, the, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> like, an enormously 3D Venn diagram. And yet, as I'm saying that, I'm already feeling like Wittgenstein would be cursing me from, from I was about to say from above, from <laughs> below, from all directions. Um, because of course, the kind of feelings that we express are shaped up, shaped by the context in which we grow up, right? And And I think, I think all of that stuff is 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 hugely rich and hugely um, fertile grounds for for thinking. And certainly, being in Japan and seeing how people identified emotions and feelings um, made me think much more, kind of concisely about it gave me a lot of clarity not only about what was going on for them but also what I was doing in English when I named a feeling or um tried to describe that um I, I guess in summary it's massively, massively, massively complex, and I sort of would need to write another book about it. And still, then it would probably not be <laughs> very coherent. <laughs> You'll look forward to that <laughs> next book. But also, it reminds me of Quentin Crisp, who already said in you know in 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 the fifties in the Naked Civil Servant that human beings rarely restrict themselves to the emotions that they're entitled to, uh, and it's sort of a nice sense in which yeah, yeah. the normative aspect to that this is what you're allowed to feel, but actually we feel all kinds of things that right. may may even remain nameless. There's a, there's one more question mm. um, from from Ron Bird. Uh, could Polly speak to the nuance of translating regional Japanese dialect, Ben? Many thanks. Yes. Um, so the the old guard of translation theory, I suppose, was well, not theory, but translational practice was that you know if you were dealing with a regional dialect in whatever language you're working from Japanese, then, you know, naturally you should put it into a regional dialect in English. And, and so if you're translating Osaka Ben, it should go into, you know, it should become Manchester. Um, <laughs> for example, um, and, and, you know, and th this has been done. Um, this has been done. The flaws with that approach are, I would say, relatively obvious that, you know, Osaka is a very particular place with geographical 
peculiarities um, and cultural peculiarities and so is Manchester and some of those you know there may be correlates that that exist and similarities but you know by implanting in the reader you know but by giving the reader kind of the vibe of Manchester you are potentially suggesting more far more of a correlation than that exists there and which may be radically inappropriate in some way so the kind of prevailing translation no trend now is um not to do that um so then the question becomes right how you've got this incredibly flavorful nuance rich dialect how do you a translate all the informational content that is transmitted through that it, i'm not talking about in terms of what's being said specifically so much as like the particular context that would be immediately obvious to a Japanese reader reading that um and b how do you convey the um the 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 well everything the character the fun the the joy the the levity the sarcasm whatever it is in in you know that, that that's that's conveyed in that um in the Japanese and and I've heard various different translators talking about their method for doing that. Um, Jinny Tapri Takimori, who translated um, Convenience Store Woman, often says that what she does is make, <laughs> make her own kind of English sounding in, dialect in English that is not specifically tied to a place. Um, so it's conveying some of the whatever she feels from the Japanese, but doesn't have the problem of being clearly Yorkshire or Manchester or Scotland or whatever. Um, it's something that I wrestle with a lot, and it's something that comes up again and again. There's a character from Osaka in um, There's No Such Thing as an Easy Job, and Aoko Matsuda uses a lot of different kinds of dialects. Um, I can't reveal my personal secrets, but I, th <laughs> I think, I think what I would say is just uh, the same thing that I always say is it's not actually that different from other kinds of translation in that you are finding a voice that works um and sometimes what it means is finding a voice that works and then adding in through uh, other routes the additional information that this character is from kansai or or whatever you know something that would be obvious to the japanese readership um but yeah, it it it's a perpetu you know, it's one of the the hardest aspects of being a translator, I suppose. Right. Thank you very much. Any last questions? If not, please join me in thanking Polly Barton. Thank you very much for coming. It's a really very animated and fun talk. Um all of you here, please return next week. Um again, no. Oh. There's now suddenly we complained about the um the events page it should the, all the future events should come up and now all the past events come up <laughs> um professor gramlich oka uh, who is visiting uh, paris she will come over from paris she's uh, usually she's at vasita isn't she or at, at sophie uh, Sophia, apologies. Uh, she will uh, talk about her uh, recent historical research um please sign up on the uh, page um and uh, join us again have a good evening and please travel safely to wherever you go <laughs>